name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So we started this holy season of Lent on Wednesday, and now we are at the first Sunday of Lent. And every time we get to this Sunday, we have this same story, a different version of this story. Um, and it's somewhat of an abrupt story. Uh, and Mark, it's so abrupt that, uh, that the two can't be separated from one another. And so uh, we have his baptism told when we uh, have him going into the wilderness. Uh, so Jesus is baptized. And remember that glorious moment, uh, a moment that would be the moment uh, in any of our existence when we come out of those waters of baptism and we have our Lord and Maker's voice say to us clearly for everyone to hear, this is my child my beloved with whom I am well pleased. Wow. And then before we even get to cut the cake, we are sent dramatically out into the desert. 40 days in the desert. Jesus' baptism uh, was his preparation, was his moment of preparation for what was to come, but it wasn't enough. He had to go into the wilderness and to confront the particulars of what he, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Word in whom all things came into being, would have to overcome to be able to do what has changed the world forever, what has brought us here into church. And there are three principal temptations that he's confronted with. The first one, he's fully human. He gave up the ability to be objectively from afar to live and feel what it is to be human. Even more so, he lived fully what it was to be human with self-denial that none of us really realize. And so the first temptation is self-denial. Could he deny all of those urges and temptations that we give into, starting with hunger, um, but lust and the desire for uh, you know, a, a two-car garage and a nice, tidy family? Could he give up all of that to be who he was called to be? Could he give up the things that we yearn for in the human experience to be the savior of the world? Second, we even say it in the creed uh, that Jesus humbled himself, that he gave up certain amounts of power to come in human form. That he humbled himself to take on our form, to walk as we walk, to be the incarnate God that reconciles humanity to the divine forever. With that comes a loss of power. How tempting might it have been to say, you know what, I don't have to humble myself. I don't have to submit all the way to the cross. I'm more powerful than this. I can have more than this. And the third. The third, and Luke uh, rearranges the order because the third critically points us to Jerusalem. And it's funny, the actual translation of the word pinnacle, uh, they think, is the parapet, uh, which uh, spending two years designing the uh, expansion, parapet was a word that uh, I became very, very familiar with. Uh, but they think that it's the parapet around uh, the temple that they're talking about, uh, but it's squarely pointed towards Jerusalem. Do you trust in God the Father enough to do anything? Do you trust him enough to let your body hang from a cross? Do you trust him enough uh, to go through the first two, to give up those urges, to surrender your power, to trust in God that the cross will lead to something redeeming and not just death? Do you trust? That was Jesus' particular temptations that he had to go through in order to be the savior that the world so desperately needed. Where do we have to go? And I used to think of Lent much like I used to think of the confession, that it was sort of the most onerous uh, part of the church year or the most onerous part of the church service uh, where we sort of came in and we acknowledged that we weren't perfect and we've erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. And, uh, and I just sort of felt like it was um, uh, not quite self-flagellation, but it was a little bit of that uh, acknowledging our brokenness and our, uh, 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 our depravity before God. And I don't think that's the whole of it. 
I've come to think of both of those moments as incredibly hope-filled moments of the recognition that I do make mistakes, that I do lose my course. So much like a ship, uh, it is liberating to be able to know that if you turn the keel, you can rearrange your direction. And this place has been for me a moment where I can come in every week and have to several times a week and say, I just am not quite hitting the mark. How do I recalibrate? And how do I do it with the assurance that God is with me and that when I ask for recalibration, uh, that God is not only forgiving uh, the false misdirections that I, of my past, uh, but is helping to guide me in the future. And I think that's the same thing that this season provides us, an incredible opportunity to redirect. But I don't want you just to think about all of the things that you've done wrong over the last year and, and uh, how you might be able to uh, correct course, um, how many... Uh, uh, fatty foods we, uh, we may have consumed in the past year that we want to uh, do differently this year or, or uh, 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 drinks that we've consumed or failure to exercise or failure to treat one another as well as we should have or failure to read the Bible. I want you to think in terms of big picture. Who are you? Use this wilderness time to ask yourself, who are you? Whose are you? How do you understand the universe and creation and your part in it? How do you understand God and evil? And see what percolates. I use three images that I hope uh, you can carry through this Lenten season. Hopefully at least one of them uh, will, will sink in that I used on Ash Wednesday. Um, the first, like Paul talks about, that treasure in earthen vessels or clay jars, that we have a treasure in clay jars or earthen vessels. And I use the illustration of the, uh, the girl tirelessly preparing this, uh, uh, this art project, this porcelain art project for her mom. Uh, and did the love and the value exist on the outside uh, when it hit the ground and, and broke? Or was it in all that went into it? Where are we precious? Is it in the outer layer or is it in all those things that make us? The fact that we were made in God's image, the fact that God loves us unconditionally, the fact that uh, we have been redeemed by a God who poured out his love on the cross. We are earthen vessels with a treasure within us. Two, second image I want you to think of is that bread. That a slice of bread, when we pull it out of the container, doesn't marvel us very much. Uh, but when we hand it to somebody who hasn't eaten for days, it's everything. And when we do it, looking them in the eyes and hand it to them in solidarity with the fact that they are our brothers and sisters and that we feel their hunger, it becomes even more valuable. And when we take it to the altar and we ask God's blessing upon it, and we acknowledge it as the body of Christ broken for us, it becomes filled with hope and love poured out for the world. So do we. Think of your lives in terms of that. And the third, that image of ash in the shape of a cross is our identity. Ashes or dust made holy by the fact that we were made by love that we were redeemed by love, that love was poured out upon the cross so that we might never be separated from that identity as Christ's own forever. Take those three images and ask yourself, how fully do you live into them? And what does that mean for the world? If you look at all creation, not just you, uh, but the person sitting next to you, and not just the person sitting next to you, but all of creation as imbued with that love and that holiness as being of God. Albert Einstein said the most important question we confront as a people is, is the world a friendly place? With all the years of research and all the formulas, he said the most important question we are ever tasked with answering is, do we believe that the world is a friendly place? And he says, if you answer no, you will spend all of your creative energy, all of your technology, and all of uh, the gifts that you have trying to protect yourself, trying to keep the other away. And you'll probably be successful. At what end? He said, if you, don't, if you think the world is neither friendly or unfriendly and you think God's just rolling the dice, he said, you can get through life, but you'll come to the realization that you have no purpose, that you're just 
a random collection of molecules vibrating against another random collection of molecules and that your life has no real purpose. But if you believe that the world that God created is indeed of God and is a friendly place, then your creative energy goes towards understanding it more fully, towards connecting with all of the pieces of God's creation. And just think about wonderful things that could be opened up by that possibility. So I invite you during this Lenten season not just to think about the things that you've gone done wrong or uh, ways you've gone astray that you'd like to correct, but ask those questions. Whose am I? What image really resonates with me about why I'm here and who I am? And how does that cause me to respond to the universe? What is evil in my life? Is it failing to accept that truth and that identity? Or failing to see that truth and that identity in others? Is it my worldview and how I see the universe? And as you percolate on it, I encourage you to take a notepad out and write down what questions come to mind. What things would you like to challenge yourself uh, to overcome or to think differently about? And then maybe after we get out of the desert, we might find that we are closer to that solidarity in being one with not just the one who made us, the one who made us out of dust, but with the other people who are trying to walk the same walk and the rest of all creation, made so lovingly by God, a friendly and loving God.